Why are there so many different churches in the world? Have you ever heard anyone ask that question? Not only are there many different religions in the world, such as Hinduism and Islam and Confucianism and Buddhism, paganism, but Christianity itself is split up into many hundred, even thousands of different denominations. And so this puzzles people and it discourages people and they know that Jesus himself prayed that his followers may be one and that it is God's purpose to gather together in one, the children of God that were scattered abroad. And so the question naturally arises, has God's word failed? Is faith in Christ ineffective so that it creates these walls of separation between believers and doesn't really create unity? Well, no, this vast, complex confusion is not God's fault, folks. In one of the interesting stories that Jesus described, he was telling about how the tares and the wheat weeds sprang up in a field that had been sown with good grain, and the farmer told his servants, an enemy hath done this, in Matthew 13, 28. So confusion and strife among the professed people of Christ is the work of a master enemy, someone who has come in and sown tares and weeds. But God will not permit even one sincere seeker for truth to remain in confusion or mis being misled. So why are there so many different factions of Christianity? The answer is found by looking at who caused all of this strife and confusion to begin with. And it started it itself in heaven. Because heaven was once united, it was peaceful, until an enemy arose who had led one-third of the angels into a rebellion, into an offshoot. It says in Revelation 12, verse 7, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon was cast out, the old serpent, called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now this same enemy is continuing the war on earth, and this time he is concentrating his efforts on the body of Christ, on his church. And it would be foolish for us to condemn the church because of the havoc that this enemy has caused, because his avowed purpose is to discredit the church of God, and thus discredit the head of the church. But since he cannot touch the head, he zeroes in on God's people on this earth. The revelator says in verse 12, The devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Everyone knows that a very successful tactic of warfare is to divide and conquer. And Satan knows that he can deceive many into being confused by the multiplicity of denominations in the world so that they get discouraged and they give up their search for the body of Christ. It's like counterfeiting money. You know, a clever artist can fool ordinary people by printing look-alike paper money. But it would be foolish to say, wouldn't it, I will not accept any money unless lest I make a mistake and get a counterfeit bill. If Satan has succeeded in splitting the church into hundreds of competing denominations, there must be somewhere a true body of Christ that he recognizes as his. Amen. And the counterfeit proves the existence that the genuine exists. Amen. And that's why the Lord has seen fit to give us a disclosure of this truth in the book of Revelation, chapter 12. And there the story is told of the true body of Christ, the true church throughout all of the ages. And it is unfolded to us under the symbolism of a woman with her children who is chased by a dragon 
as he seeks to destroy her. And we read in verse 13, when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman, which brought forth the man-child, that would be Christ. And so he, she fled into the wilderness for 1260 years, it says in verse 6. So we have seen that history records the terrible suffering that the faithful people of God had to endure between 538 A.D. to 1798 A.D. And Revelation 12 indicates that God has always had a true church on earth, a church that believed and cherished the truths that Christ and his apostles taught, a church that faithfully handed down to succeeding generations a knowledge of God's plan of salvation for the world. And it is Satan's enmity against Christ, it's his hatred against Christ that's demonstrated in a final assault that he makes upon the church. And you read about that in Revelation 12, verse 15. It says, And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of, the, of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth or angry with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Amen. The flood, that's a vivid way of describing Satan's manifold methods of opposing God's work on earth. But in spite of it all, the woman stands secure. The woman is the true church represented here in prophecy. And the Holy Spirit will guide every sincere seeker of truth to her door. According to scripture, the church is the body of Christ. Paul had this magnificent revelation from God to illustrate the fact that the body is the church and it's related to Christ as being her head. This sympathy that exists between the head and the body. A magnificent illustration of the church's unity with its head Christ. And it, the scripture also uses the metaphor of the bride of Christ as being the church. Christ is the head of the church. A head without a body cannot be complete, nor can a husband be complete without a wife. And so it follows that it is impossible to have a mature faith in Christ without being a part of Christ's body. Think about that. The body has a head. Christ is the head of the church. Amen. It's impossible for you, for me, for anyone to have a mature faith without connection to that head Amen. who is Christ. And that means that the church is not merely a human organization. It was founded on Christ himself. Amen. And we read that it is the Lord's purpose to add to the church daily such as should be saved. In Acts chapter 2, verse 47. So it is, in, it is tremendously important that we find his true church, the body of Christ. Tremendously important. Amen. Amen. And in order to discover where the church is, we must first of all be sure of the foundation Amen. on which that church is built. Amen. Now Jesus said this to Peter. I tell you, Peter... And the word Peter there is uh, in the original Petros. And on this, I tell you, you are Peter, Petros. And on this rock, and the original is Petra, I will build my church. Talking about the foundation. And the powers of death shall not prevail against it. Now that word in the original Petros, in which Jesus addressed 
the Apostle Peter, that language means a stone that is so small that it can be thrown around. Now, surely this cannot be the foundation of the Church of Christ, a stone that can be thrown around. On the other hand, the word Petra in the original means a great, massive outcropping of bedrock. Bedrock, the kind that can never be moved, Amen. the kind that you would want to build, for, let's say as an architect, a skyscraper on it, Amen. so that it cannot be moved. This represents the true foundation of the church. It's Christ himself. He, Jesus, was happy. He was very happy with Peter's confession that we read here in chapter 16 of Matthew. Verse 16, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Christ was pleased that the Father had revealed that to Peter. And we learn from this that such faith in Christ as the Son of God, that is the essential step of being a member of the true body of Christ. Amen. It's very obvious that Peter himself could never be the foundation on which Christ would build his church. For only a few minutes later, we read about how Jesus was forced to rebuke Peter very severely. He turned and he said to Peter, Get thee behind me, verse 23. Satan, you are a hindrance to me, for you are not on the side of God, but of men. Now Christ's true church needs a better foundation than such a rolling stone as that. That needs such a rebuke as that. Only Christ himself, folks, has ever conquered death. The apostle Peter has not conquered death. Therefore, any church, in order for it to stand immovable against the powers of death, must be founded on He who said, I am the resurrection and the life. Amen. Now that gives us a very valuable clue in discovering where Christ's true church is. Any church that claims to have been founded on Peter cannot be it. What are the markers, what is the DNA that is transmitted by the head to the body that we can identify from Scripture indicating the true church of Christ? Well, let's look at some briefly right now. The true church seems very obvious. will accept the Bible as its foundation for its beliefs and practices. Amen? Amen. It's the Bible that is inspired by God through His Holy Spirit. The true church also worships the one true God who has revealed Himself through the Scriptures as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Bible teaches us regarding the Godhead. Both It appeals logically to our minds as well as to our hearts. And Jesus aptly said that his works were wrought for the purpose that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. John 10 verse 38. The mind can grasp this family oneness of the Father and the Son. And the divine gift of faith makes it possible for the individual to choose to believe the truth of the Godhead as taught in Scripture. You see, a family is known by its last name. There is, for example, a Mr. and Mrs. Smith and their children. And as a family unit, they are one by name. They are one by character and certain personality traits. And yet the Smith family is composed of individual persons. And so when outsiders look at individuals of the Smith family, they see common resemblances of looks and character. And so the Bible uses the term Godhead as a family name for God in heaven. At Athens, Paul declared this, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man, 
of man's device. You see, we are the descendants, we are the progeny of this Godhead. And it is illogical to say that man and woman is the handiwork of human shaping of inanimate objects such as gold and silver or stone. No, folks, we as male and female man are made in the image of God. Amen. The family of the Godhead. We are made in their image. And as a human family, we have the general characteristics of the Godhead. We have intelligence. God has intelligence. We have form. We have capacity to reproduce. There's a resemblance there between us and our God who created us. And those features, to some extent, indicate the nature of our designer and creator. Amen. So scripture presents the family of the Godhead consisting of three distinct persons. And there is only one God as opposed to several gods. And the one God has three members, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So the Bible clearly teaches a strict monotheism. In Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, we read here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Here is a strict monotheism, and Seventh-day Adventists are monotheists. But another marker of DNA characteristic from our head is that Jesus commanded us to baptize believers in the name. And the name there, the family name, is the Godhead. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28 and verse 20. There are three distinct persons. One God. The true church will practice the same mode of baptism that Jesus instituted and gave to his apostles and also participated in himself on being baptized on behalf of the whole human family when he was immersed by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. Amen. This is like a gateway through which we all, coming out of disobedience and alienation from God, enter into Christ by faith and fellowship with his body, the church. And the body of Christ will cooperate with God's work of grace, accomplished by good news that is proclaimed in three special angels that are presented there in the book of Revelation, chapter 14. Because we are told there that the first angel is like a helicopter flying over the treetops throughout all of the world, proclaiming the everlasting gospel, it says. The everlasting good news. And so from that we know that this good news is not a new invention. But it is, it is all, the gospel, God's plan of salvation has always been the same for every generation, including in the Old Testament of saving people through the blood of Jesus Christ. But it is given in a modern setting so that people, it meets people's needs today. And it is the clearest gospel of them all. The clearest understanding. It is in language that people can understand today, symbolized as the, the truth that is proclaimed by the three angels flying like helicopters over the treetops. Here it is in Revelation 14, 6 and 7. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. It's clear then the angel symbolizes a worldwide proclamation of pure, unadulterated truth. Amen. A rediscovery of something long lost sight of. It probes the solution to mankind's deepest psychological and spiritual needs. It is the conquest 
of our inner insecurities and anxiety through the good news about Jesus. And so it embodies a deliverance from every evil that enslaves or distorts the human soul. And then, following this first angel are a second and a third. They are bringing the first angel's message to completion. The message of the three angels then achieves a phenomenal worldwide impact. It says every nation, tribe, tongue, and people hear it. Now that must have been, that was a courageous prediction made by John over 2,000 years ago in the book of Revelation. It should give us courage today, shouldn't it? To believe it today. Amen. To believe it. Amen. And why is this message so striking? It says, Revelation 14, 7, Worship him who made heaven and earth. Now that really, in contemporary terms, is swimming upstream almost, alone against the world that currently believes in the evolutionary teaching. That this, this is a creation message that makes its way against very popular opinion. And the memorial of God's creation that God appointed is the Seventh-day Sabbath. Amen. That would help us to never forget that He is the creator of this earth. Amen. The true Lord's day is the seventh day. And already in response to this angel's message, there are millions of Christians who, who keep the Seventh-day Sabbath. They have sprung up everywhere in practically every nation in this world. And then there is the call to fear God and give glory to Him. And that doesn't mean for us to crawl around on our stomachs like a cowering slave before a tyrannical master, but it means to reverence Him, to cherish a humble appreciation of His love and holy righteousness. God doesn't want us to shake with terror before Him, but to shiver with the delightful thrill of appreciating His glorious self-sacrifice, his glorious revelation of himself, Amen. Amen. which led the Son of God to yield himself totally, giving himself to us on the cross. Yes. The death that he died for us was the equivalent of what Revelation calls the second death, the final yet unknown despair of being forsaken of God. You never have to worry about that. Jesus experienced that for you. Amen. And nor is God a selfish potentate reveling in the shallow flattery of fawning admirers. To give glory to Him means to cooperate with the Holy Spirit in demonstrating His love to the world. To pass the welcoming message on to the world be reconciled to God. God's greatest joy is seeing alienated, miserable, wrecked people find the sunshine of a healing reconciliation to Him. This is His glory. The glory of God is saving lost people. And when we give Him glory by ministering with Him in that work of reconciliation, we are giving glory to Him by participating in His saving work in this world. God doesn't want anyone to serve Him in terror of being condemned in judgment. The house, the, the hour of His judgment cannot be the hour when God condemns the world. Because Jesus Himself said, God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, John 3.17, but that the world through Him might be saved. And if anyone is condemned at last, it won't be the Father who condemns him. Because Jesus said, the Father judges no one, but has committed judgment, all judgment, to the Son. John 5, verse 22. And furthermore, Jesus says that neither will he condemn those who reject him. In John 12, 47, if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world, he said. Amen. So it's evident that those who finally reject God's grace 
are not going to hear any scathing, denunciating words either from the Father or the Son amid the silence from God. The voice of their own accusing conscience will be deafening. He who rejects me, says Jesus, John 12, 48, and does not receive my words, has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. The conscience that has been educated by the word of God will condemn that soul. And the one whom Christ will judge, he vindicates. I confess his name, he says, before my Father. The result of the judgment is that Jesus confesses your name, my name, before the Father. Amen. So the angels call to believe God's everlasting gospel is in the context of the hour of his judgment is really a message that is assuring us of vindication. It tells us that in Christ God has accepted us, he's forgiven us, he's adopted us, and he's elected us through Christ to be saved. So these three angels proclaim an arresting message that focuses all of the revealed truth that God has been communicating for thousands of years, demanding at last a thoroughgoing response. No one can sit on the fence after hearing and understanding this last day message. Everyone will choose either to believe and respond or to disbelieve and to reject. And they will line up on one side or the other in the final battle of Armageddon. Another DNA marker of God's Christ's body is that it will demonstrate the beautiful fruits of a living faith in God by being different from the world in purity of life, Amen. in temperance, in self-control, in choice of our recreation and amusements, even in the standards of modesty with which we dress. Another marker, DNA marker, is 2,000 years ago, God's people were expecting their long-awaited Messiah to appear, but when he came as a little baby in Bethlehem, they didn't recognize him, and the leaders of the true church of that day led the people to murder him of all things. And now, God's people today are expecting, one of the DNA markers of the of Christ who is ahead, we are expecting a great blessing to come from heaven. And that is the long promised latter rain, the outpouring of his Holy Spirit that will lighten the earth with God's glory. And it will be a message that will prepare God's people to be ready for the second coming of Christ. Not everyone on earth will be converted, for many will reject as many rejected Jesus long ago, but the message will seek out honest hearts everywhere who will respond. And the Lord will be honored. And some will come from places that will seem unlikely to those who have been in the way for a long time. And the message of the everlasting gospel will be presented so clearly and powerfully that Christ will be uplifted as the crucified Son of God. Amen. He not only died for the world in a vague corporate sense, but he also died for each individual soul and each who permits his heart to be moved by the love of Christ that constrains us will be sanctified by the message that will be finally full-blown. And the watching universe is going to be amazed at the transformations that the pure, true gospel will accomplish. As Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. But it is Satan's cleverness that has confused the truth of the gospel, even as certain men who came from James, the early leader of the church in Paul's day, confused even Peter and Barnabas. It says in Galatians 2.6, so the story of that stumbling on the part of the early leaders of the church is not well known, and Paul was right. But his gospel presented in the book of Romans is the clearest gospel of them all. 
And that often neglected, this often neglected story of human fallibility encourages us to study what is the truth of the gospel directly for ourselves. Even in modern times, there are sincere converted leaders that can err and can mislead people, even like the faithful such as Barnabas long ago. There is no prayer that heaven is more eager to answer than the prayer of an honest heart who wants to understand the truth of the gospel. The Lord would rather empty out heaven of its angels, sending them all down here to help one poor soul, rather than allow that soul to become misled and confused. Amen. And so the church will proclaim to the world the pure truth of God's word. For the Apostle Paul says that the truth of the living God is the pillar and support of the church. Amen. First Timothy 3.15 God has no other way of communicating to the world his truth. He cannot write it in burning letters of fire on the clouds. He can't command the clouds and the storms to shout it. Mankind must hear the truth proclaimed through warm human lips. Amen. And his true church is that voice. Amen. And unless God's word is a failure, and that is unthinkable, there is such a church Amen. on this earth. The church, true church will be a worldwide body proclaiming a message to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And Jesus predicted that his gospel message shall be preached in all of the world for a witness unto all nations. And no sect or denomination that works in limited areas of the world can fit that inspired criteria of identification. And then another often neglected truth is that which concerns the work of Christ as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. And that this work has to do with the great battle that is going on right now between Christ and Satan, which Revelation 12 describes. Because this sanctuary ministry of Christ is to bring an end to Satan's dominion over human hearts and lives. That's the practical truth of it. It is to accomplish something that has never yet been fully accomplished in Christ's body during all of the thousand years of history. Body of Christ's body, it Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary is to destroy sin completely, Amen. both on this earth and in the universe. Amen. Another way of putting it is the blotting out of sin, so that Christ can appear the second time, as Paul writes, without sin unto salvation for those who are his. It is to prepare a faithful people to stand before him, without fear, Amen. for our God is a consuming fire. Amen. Nothing happening in all of the world today is as important as this grand ministry which Christ is performing now for us Amen. in the heavenly sanctuary. Amen. Speaking of the time when it is to be completed, our Lord says this in Luke 21, 34, Keep a watch on yourselves. Do not let your mind be dulled by dissipation and drunkenness and worldly cares, so that the great day closes upon you suddenly like a trap. For that day will come on all men, wherever they are, the whole world over. Be on the alert, praying at all times, for strength to pass safely through all of these imminent troubles and to stand in the presence of the Son of Man. Amen. And then the next event to follow the last day message of the three angels is the personal, literal second coming of Christ Amen. in the clouds of heaven. Another DNA marker of the Christ the head of this church. The work of the true church is to proclaim the good news of the coming of Jesus Christ everywhere so that a people can be prepared to meet him when he comes. 
It's nice to remember that if and when we die, we can come up in the first resurrection. But is that the blessed hope that Paul talks about? The grace of God, he writes in Titus chapter 2, verse 11, has appeared, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, the blessed hope is what Paul describes as being alive and remaining on this earth when he comes. Amen. Being alive and remain on this earth to welcome the Son of God Amen. at His second coming. And some people say, well, it doesn't matter. We can come up in a special resurrection prior to His coming and thus remain. But this implies there is no real significance to the signs of the times that we have witnessed for the past century and a half. There are multitudes of believers who have died in the past 2,000 years. But Daniel's time of the end defines when those who cherish the blessed hope will be living. And that time is now. It's Paul's last days he speaks of, and it's the same time Jesus speaks of. There will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth, the stress of nations with perplexity, and men's hearts failing them for fear, and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. Know that the kingdom of God is near. Amen. And Matthew adds, even at the doors. The Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect Him. The suddenness of His coming will surprise even me and you. Cherishing the blessed hope of seeing Him come in your lifetime, that is not a quirky little idiosyncrasy for some unbalanced older people. It's Christian duty for us all because it's present truth. And the true church must understand what the Bible teaches about death and eternal life. Never before have so many people in the world been concerned about the meaning of death. The Bible teaches that man's nature is mortal, that is subject to death. Only God hath immortality. Amen. And the idea that man's soul is naturally immortal, that came from ancient paganism, and it is not from divine revelation. But through Christ, God will confer upon His people the gift of immortality at the resurrection. And that means that at the present time, the dead are asleep, unconscious of the passage of time or of events on earth. It's impossible for them to communicate with their loved ones on this earth. It's important that the true church make this clear. Otherwise... Many will be deceived by clever evil spirits who counterfeit the dead through the power of Satan and his fallen angels. But God's truth about the dead is a marvelous shield of protection from that deception of the devil. The true church must also make clear what the Bible teaches about the future life. It will not bring glory to God for him to perpetuate the existence of sin and sinners throughout all eternity. What righteous person could possibly be happy in heaven if he continually looked over to watch the helpless lost people writhing and screaming in eternal agony? Scripture teaches that the lost will perish in the second death. And that sin and its originator, Satan, will also be destroyed forever. And the good news is that affliction shall not rise up the second time. Amen. Sin and rebellion will be forever ended. Amen. The church, true church must also enjoy the gifts that the Holy Spirit imparts. And one of those gifts is the gift of prophecy, which the Bible of book of Revelation singles out for special mention as a criteria as a DNA marker of the true church in the last days. And the dragon, that Satan, was wroth or angry with the woman, the church, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Amen. And in Revelation 19.10, the testimony of Jesus 
is the spirit of prophecy. Amen. And that gift provides for direct communication between Jesus and his people through a messenger chosen for our time, a prophet. And this gift is a lesser light that leads to the greater light of the Bible. Amen. And so, in the last page of the Bible, it gives us this invitation to come if we are thirsty. Take the water of life freely, writes John, Amen. the words of Christ. And Christ says, come to me. If we are weary and heavy laden, Amen. he will give us rest. And so we come and we are baptized and we become members of the church and we are so happy at last to find fellowship in the Lord and heaven on earth. Amen. Jesus has faithfully promised to us, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. And so we boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? You choose not to be afraid in the Lord, and then you are not afraid. Amen. And even in the church, the Lord's house, where we expect to find heaven on earth, sometimes we find conflict, but those, sometimes that conflict is severe and painful, but the Lord still assures us, I will not forsake you, though I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. The Lord loves you, his people, his church, which is yet to become the bride of Christ. And it does indeed have very severe issues to deal with within it, but Jesus tells us that Laodicea will overcome, and from it will come the bride of Christ. And he will find a mate worthy for him to be united with in the great wedding. The final victory in the great controversy between Christ and Satan comes at the very end, and it requires that the church finally overcome and do what he says there in Revelation 3.19 of repent. And it won't at last be fear that motivates her, but a deeper appreciation of what it cost him to save us. That melted hearted repentance will come. And it has to come. Amen. And so hang on. And so I recommend to you to consider very seriously that those DNA markers are manifested in the Seventh-day Adventist Church this day. You may have confidence that God, that Christ is the head and leading this Amen. church. Amen. And during this season of special outreach in our community, you can be channels of living water to others Amen. by giving them an invitation. Amen. And they will be so blessed Amen. as a result of hearing new things that they have not heard before yes. that will open up new avenues of light and truth for them. And not only will their minds be reasoned with, but their hearts will be touched, dear folks. Amen. Because not only truth is reasonable, but it is heartwarming. It has warmed and is warming our hearts, and we can share that with others. And may God bless to that end, we pray. Amen.